<laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I think this is a great event. I'm very happy that it was put together uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, Richmond Barak. Um, I'm very grateful to be here today. I think this uh, has great potential for us, and I'll try to explain a little bit why I think that is so. Um, my presentation is going to be about the technological solutions to subterranean challenges. And the first question that comes up is, is why even bother? Why do we even need technological solutions to uh, subterranean warfare? And I think that for, for us here in Israel, uh, the thing that really brought this point home, that we had to do something to have good solutions for this, was, uh, was the cross-border tunnels uh, in the Gaza Strip, coming in from Gaza, allowing Hamas to launch raids into Israel. And it all started in 2006, I think, really, with the abduction of Gilad Shalit. Uh, in summer 2006, some of you may remember this, uh, a group of Hamas terrorists crossed underneath the ground, crossed from Gaza into Israel along the southern part of uh, the Gaza Strip, and basically were able to attack a tank that was stationed along the border uh, from behind, killing some ta tank, some of the uh, crew members, and abducting uh, Corporal Yilad Shalit into Gaza. And basically, that was a uh, a very bad event uh, for Israel in many ways. You know, the, the abduction only ended five years after the event in a massive prisoner exchange where we exchanged one person for a great amount of, uh, of uh, terrorists that we had to release. And I think the point was that in this event, the Hamas learned a very valuable lesson that we failed to learn at that time. And what we met uh, eight years later, almost a decade later in 2014, was an organization built to utilize attack tunnels from Gaza into Israel. And they had built most of their offensive capabilities around uh, tunnels, basically. And this is a picture from Operation Protective Edge in 2014, where 13 Hamas uh, uh, terrorists emerged from a tunnel in a, one of the fields, nowhere near any military outpost that we held at the time. And apparently, they were aimed at, uh, at reaching one of the villages around the Gaza Strip and attacking it. And, and this is a strategic, cha strategic change for Hamas, because they went from, uh, from one small special operation that they launched in 2006 to a system that was built up. And it was, I, I always think of it as an industrial uh, system, because this is the type of tunnel that we met in 2014. This tunnel is, it isn't a craftsmanship project by a group of dedicated workers uh, burrowing underground. It isn't the 400 or 500 uh, meter long, you know, very short, uh, very small tunnel that we saw in 2006 when Gilad Shalit was abducted. You know, in that case, they had to crawl 400 meters uh, because they were trying to dig something very small. In this case, this is a walking tunnel. You see those concrete uh, uh, linings, the concrete shorings. These are produced. They're not, it's not somebody in their uh, garage workshop building these. There's a factory building these things. And for all, uh, I believe it's 30 tunnels that we had to deal with during Operation Protective Edge, the shoring was the same for all of them, basically. So this is something that Hamas learned from in 2006 and decided that he was going to, they were going to transform this into their strategic offensive arm. And they built up capabilities for that. They had to build factories. They had to build, you know, train people to do this. They have electricians um, who are specially trained for tunnels. And basically in 2014, we met an operational that was industrial age. Um, now, another point is that during that same time, this uh, handsome gentleman that you see over here, he was studying for his PhD in civil engineering in the Islamic University in Tehran. Uh, he was sent there by Hezbollah. And basically, during the same time period that Hamas was learning how to transform that special operation tunnel into an industrial age tunnel uh, along the Gaza-Israel frontier, this gentleman was launching a project, a similar project for Hezbollah. And this is the photo that we took of him uh, during op Operation Northern Shield uh, exactly one year ago. Exactly one year ago? Right. Um, and basically, the Hezbollah had been building the similar capability the whole time that we were thinking about Hamas. And fortunately enough, we learned about that in time and we were able to stop that threat as well. 
This was released a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if any of you uh, caught this uh, release. This is a tunnel that was picked up uh, on the Syrian-Iraqi uh, border. Um, I don't know if I pronounced the place correctly. I think it's Al Bukamo. And this is a tunnel that was excavated by uh, Iranian forces to allow proliferation of arms from Iran through Iraq into Syria and then probably onto Lebanon as well. Um, and this is another point that, you know, if, if we ever feel like we were at a good place with infiltration tunnels that are dug across the border into Israel, then we should start worrying about these that are further away, but also uh, interesting and also uh, allow Iran to, Iran to project their force out uh, to our neighbors uh, in, the, in this part of the Middle East. Um, last, you know, I want to show you this video as well, just in case you're... Uh, this is President Trump declaring uh, about the, the uh, unfortunate demise of uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And I don't know if we can hear him. All right, so if we can't hear it, that's good enough, but... Sorry. It was working. Yeah, yeah. Right, never mind. So basically, I, I'm sure all of you saw this. It doesn't really matter if you see it again. But basically, uh, President Trump, uh, when he declared that uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was killed by a special uh, force unit of the United States, he said, you know, that they chased him down into a tunnel, a dead end tunnel. And I believe it's it, it was a. Uh, uh, Basically, a dead-end tunnel to me sounds a little bit like a bunker. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there is some, uh, you know, some mixing of the phrases between tunnels and bunkers and underground facilities. And basically, I, I use this as an example that if, you know, if we're ever tired of uh, infiltration tunnels that uh, come into Israel or you know, uh, proliferation tunnels that allow arms to be smuggled into the region, then you know, we always have a lot of underground facilities, bunkers that, you know, all of our, uh, all of our enemies here in the Middle East use them very, very profusely. Um, and basically, you know, there's good use for counter tunnel uh, technology. I wonder if I can skip ahead here. So, so if I convinced you that there's a good reason to develop a counter tunnel technology, Basically, the first thing that comes to mind is how should we even go about finding these tunnels? Or, or before that, how should we even go about looking for technology that will enable us to find these tunnels? And the, quest, the answer is, let me Google that for you, like it is for every other question in the world, right? Um, and that's pretty much what we did. So this is, you know, and I encourage you to try this at home later on. This is Google Scholar, and just hit tunnel detection and see what comes up. I've done it many times at this point. And there's, there are a lot of very good ideas out there. You know, the research, the international research community has been dealing with this at least since the 70s, um, in modern times at least. Um, and there's really a lot of good things online. Um, I'd say that the problem is that there are too many ideas really, not that there are not enough ideas. And another thing that happened to us was that after Operation Protective Edge in 2014, the Israeli Ministry of Defense asked the, the general public here in Israel for ideas about how to deal with this uh, threat. And, you know, for everybody, anybody living here, you know that the Israeli public is extremely engaged in everything military and defense. <coughs> everybody has served in the military, right? Everybody knows what they're doing better than the chief of staff, and, you know, they're all very uh, vocal about it. So the Ministry of Defense got about 400 ideas about how to deal with uh, tunnels. Some of them were from, you know, extremely experienced engineers, uh, professors, you know, people with a lot of experience. Some were from raving lunatics. Um, but all of the ideas were well documented and well, uh, you know, we took a lot of time into delving into these ideas and examining their validity. So the third source of ideas about how to develop tunnel detection technology came from the uh, oil and mining industries. Basically, they do something that is very similar, right? They're looking for things underground. In that context, it's similar, right? They have good systems, they have <laughs> surveys, they know what they're doing. They've been doing it for a lot of time, plus they're driven by money, so you know they're doing a good job, right? <laughs> and 
basically we looked at all the equipment they used to see what equipment could be uh, copied as it is into our systems and what had to be slightly transformed to become a military system. We looked at their techniques, at how they do data analysis, and basically we tried to learn as much as we could from them. So by the time we, we finished learning from all three sources, you know, just uh, Google Scholar, the oil and mining industry, and the Israeli public in general, we had hundreds of ideas that we had to go through. And then, and then the problem became this. I don't know if uh, any of you are familiar with this. This is one of my favorite graphs because it depicts what we've been doing for the last five years extremely well. This is the expectations uh, versus time of the life cycle of an idea, basically. Um, it all starts with some innovation, some trigger that gets going, and then you know your expectations climb insanely high in no time, right? And you reach the peak of inflated expectations, and as the name suggests, you uh, drop down as soon as you start working the idea and really facing the actual problems. And then this, uh, I don't know, the internet says this is the, I don't know if I know how to pronounce this, the trough of disillusionment. I call it the valley of death, basically, because everything dies here, right? You kind of, you have all these expectations and you start working them and then you just give up. And the good news is that we had very good teams both in the IDF and with the uh, defense contractors who are working this together and for many ideas that we had uh, and we did not give up, we were able to pull out of the valley of death and into the plateau of productivity, right? So basically at this point we took, I don't know, 600 different ideas um, and we were able to kind of wheedle them down into four, five, six, whatever number of things that actually work to detect tunnels. And they're being, uh, you know, they're in production now as they say in the oil industry. They're working out in the field and they're uh, finding tunnels. Now I will say that uh, through this entire process we had uh, We'd been working in very close collaboration with uh, our friends in the United States. This, is, this entire process has been a joint process uh, through an organization uh, of the uh, DOD known as uh, CTTSO. This is part of the NDAA language. Um, it's public knowledge and the co cooperation has been excellent for both sides. I feel some of uh, my counterparts are here so they can uh, yell out if I'm wrong, but the cooperation was very good and I think both sides have learned a lot uh, during these years. So I'm sure some of you would like to ask me at this point, why is it even difficult? Why do ideas die? Why is it not like radar? So what is radar? And I allow myself to disparage radar engineers because my brother is one of them. Um, so basically radar engineers have it so easy, right? You know, they have their radar, they have the distant target, they just shoot a pulse out there, it flies through hundreds of kilometers of open air, hits the target, is reflected back, you know, they pick it up. Their entire job is to make, you know, stronger transmitters and uh, better receivers, receivers that are more silent. That's basically it, right? Um, and they have such an easy job of this because the intermediate medium is very, very, very clean. On the other side, we have to deal with the ground. And I think there are several reasons that make the ground so difficult to deal with. The first of them is extremely intuitive to anyone who's ever been in a bomb shelter. Anybody who lives in Israel has always obviously been in bomb shelters, right? But um, basically, you know, you have bomb shelters and they're usually built underground. Now the, the reason for that is that ground is excellent at absorbing energy. If somebody's going to detonate 500 kilos of TNT anywhere nearby you, you want to have 10 meters of soil between you and the explosion, right? It is extremely intuitive, you know, that's why soldiers dig foxholes, that's why bunkers are underground. Um, and the, the bad side of that, the other side of it, is that if you're trying to look for a target underground, you have to get some kind of energy out of your transmitter to hit the target and be reflected back at you. And if you're using a medium, if you're going through a medium that absorbs energy extremely strongly, bad news, right? It's very hard to do, and that's the first reason. The second is that ground, unlike air, is extremely uh, varied. There are huge amounts of different soils and soil combinations. They have different names. If anybody is a geology buff, you know, these people, uh, 
they make a profession out of giving different names to different uh, mixtures of sand and silt and clay. You know, everything has some, some kind of different name. Um, I know them all by now, I think. But basically, the soil is extremely varied. And the bad news is not only are there different varieties, but also it's extremely varied laterally and vertically. So if you walk 10 meters in a certain direction, you're standing above a different kind of soil. Now, whatever energy you're using to try to do tunnel detection, it reacts differently with every different type of soil, and it reacts differently to the different interfaces between types of soil. So if you have a rock, and then you go into clay, and then you go back to sand, and back to rock, that wreaks havoc on whatever measurement you want. And it also is uncorrelated between different types of sensory uh, technology. So everything reacts differently to every soil. The third reason that this is difficult is portrayed somewhat in this picture, although this picture kind of does it some injustice. What you see here is an experiment in a test site. You see people standing above ground. You see a cliff face, and then you see this pipe down here. Um, and basically, the reason is the, uh, the, uh, how deep the targets usually are compared to how large they are. So the oil and mining industry, you know, they're looking for oil reservoirs that are huge, right? They want them kilometers long and kilometers wide. And they're looking kilometers deep. So that's kind of proportional in a way. But we're looking for targets that are about, you know, man-sized. And they're, uh, they could be extremely deep. I think the deepest tunnel that we found was over 70 meters deep uh, be below the border uh, between Israel and Lebanon. So we're looking for things that are much smaller and much deeper than uh, what anybody else does. Now, if you take all, of, all three of these uh, factors into account, how the ground absorbs energy, how inhomogeneous it is, and how deep and small the targets we are, you come up with the problem of sensing. And I can show you uh, this with an example of uh, ground penetrating radar. So what you see here is a graph of uh, ground penetrating radar measuring a tunnel. And Basically, every vertical line you see here is a single measurement spot. That's one place where the GPR, the ground penetrating radar, stood and uh, transmitted into the ground and then recorded all the uh, energy received back. And the basic premise here is that if, you know, if at some point there's a void, an air void in the ground, then energy will be reflected off of that interface and come back uh, and, and be absorbed by the receiver. And you see that very well over here where the red arrow is pointing, right? You see this, this phase line, right? The orange and the blue lines here that depict extremely clearly a tunnel, right? And it's about, I think, 80 feet deep. So that's pretty impressive. Um, and you actually see the kind of the face of the tunnel. You see that it's a curved face, right? Because the, the way the uh, surface there of the tunnel appears on this measurement is curved. So you know that it's not a, it's not a flat uh, ceiling for that tunnel. And, you know, and we've had many, 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 many people approach us with an idea that is exactly similar to this in a different way. You know, some people have GPRs and they'll say, I've been a GPR engineer for 20 years and I know what I'm doing. And I went out uh, to a sewage line behind my house and I measured it and this is what it looks like and you can find tunnels this way. And, you know, and for every technology, we've had these people come in and they're, they're absolutely right. You can't find tunnels this way. And they have good measurements to prove it and they have the experience to prove it, except they don't show you usually this picture. This is what the graph actually looks like when you scan 200 meters of unknown space. And you see the tunnel that I showed you before with the red line pointing at it over here. But you also see this and this and this and this and this. And they all look exactly the same. And that comes out of the ground being inhomogeneous and energy not being able to reach the target and come back and how small the target is versus how deep it is. So basically, our main problem is false alarms. There's a lot of different ways to find a tunnel if you know you're looking for it in that spot. But if you don't, then it becomes extremely hard. And that's what we've been dealing with for many years. So how do we go about finding tunnels? And I'll try to give you a brief introduction to Tunnel Dome, like Iron Dome, you know, our one monolithic solution to how to find tunnels. And the brief introduction is it doesn't exist. There is no way to, you know, produce a system or no way that we have found so far to produce a system that will give you a clear uh, solution to this type of problem. And one of my American friends recently told me when I brought up this point, he said, well, there's really no solution to above ground warfare, is there? 
So just like when your infantry uh, platoon goes out to the battlefield, you know, they'll have M16s and they'll have bazookas and they have uh, machine guns and they'll have air support and they'll have everything. Why does anybody even expect us to have a single shot solution for uh, detecting tunnels? And we have not been able to find one. Basically, what we have is we have a large variety of tools in the toolbox for the commander conducting operations against tunnels. And they can intelligently apply the tools where necessary to conduct an operation to find a tunnel. I don't want to leave you hanging just with that, though. So I will show you one of our major champions of tunnel detection, and that's this guy. Um, this is a geophone illustrated in its natural habitat. Basically, um, this is kind of like a thumbnail, except it's the size of a thumb, and it is jammed into the ground. And then it has a cable leading out the top. And what it does is records extremely accurately uh, any seismic energy in the ground. Um, for those of you who don't know what seismic energy is, it's basically sound waves, except when they're propagating in the ground. Um, they have a few more modes of propagation, uh, but it's intuitively just sound. And what this uh, little guy does is it listens to the ground. It has extreme sensitivity. Um, you know, it's kind of like what, I don't know, the cartoons have of a Native American putting their ear down to the ground to listen to the herds of buffalo. So this is kind of like that, except, you know, 21st century technology. It's very, very sensitive. It hears everything that's going on. And that's really the problem. You know, it hears everything going on. And for many years, we've been applying this technology and hearing so many things, so much more than we ever wanted to hear, right? And the problem is that you have to understand pretty well what you're actually listening to. And as I was preparing this, uh, this lecture, I came across this tweet. Um, this is some guy I follow. I don't even know who he is, but he appears to be a scientist. And he was uh, writing about, um, I hope uh, the Google Translate worked well here for translating from Hebrew into English, but he was saying that he was sitting in a lecture and some researcher was telling about the research they're conducting with the seismograph, which is like a geophone. And, you know, and they had a signal come up that was very intriguing and they were you know, analyzing it and trying to find out what it was. And then they noticed it was the church bell of the church next door. Because basically when you ring the church bell, you know, there's sound waves propagating and it hits the ground and is transformed into seismic energy. And then the researcher kind of scratches their head and that scratching your head and saying, what else could it be aside of tunnel? We've done for many, many times. And I'll tell you two examples of that. First is this, probably uh, anybody who was around in Israel in 2015 remembers this video. Uh, it was posted on Facebook by a person living in one of the villages uh, near the Israeli-Lebanese border. And he was, you know, used his phone to take a video, especially the sound of his sink. I'll let you hear it for a second. Oh, or maybe I won't. Let's see if we can hear it. Hmm. Yeah, you can hear that repetitive uh, sound. All right, this is a uh, this is a hearing test for everybody in the crowd. <laughs> Some of you passed. Um, but basically, this person, you know, he he was. He was home at night, and every night this sound, this repetitive sound would come on. And once you're living next to a border and you're afraid of cross-border tunnels, any repetitive sound kind of sounds like that. Kind of, you know, you say, oh, maybe that's Hezbollah digging under my, uh, under my house. And, you know, and all of these people, they're, they're good citizens, they're respectable citizens, they're wrong about this being excavation under their house, but that doesn't relieve us in the military from the responsibility to actually go out and check it out. And we checked it out many, many times. And I can tell you, you know, we found a horse kicking a fence once. I think in this case, I think it was their neighbor's washing machine doing the uh, cycle where it squeezes out the water, spin cycle, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different things that once you're in tune to odd noises and how they could be a jackhammer operating, you start hearing them and saying, hmm, maybe there's a jackhammer operating. The real hero, though, of this part of my lecture is this guy. This is a cricket mole, or maybe a mole cricket. Um, it has a Latin name. I can't pronounce it. Um, in Hebrew, for anybody looking online, and 
This guy is a pretty uh, large creature. You see this is a one centimeter marking over here. Um, and it burrows into the ground about um, one or two feet deep. And then it makes this sound, and I really hope you'll we'll be able to hear this. I can tell you from experience that it goes on night after night after night after night of this. Um, and I don't know if anybody has ever had, you know, construction work done in the apartment next to theirs and someone using a jackhammer, but it's very similar. So when we first started using this technology to find tunnels, we took this recording, you know, some, uh, one of the people living around Gaza, you know, took his phone out to the yard and said, listen, Hamas is excavating right underneath my house right now and you know and they sent us this recording through uh, WhatsApp and we took it to the biggest experts that we had you know anybody who would listen to this and you know and everybody said you know that's a jackhammer he's absolutely right and we spent I don't know five or six weeks in that person's yard staking out the jackhammer trying to see if it moved around and find you know the source and when we found the source it was pretty sad um, especially for the cricket <laughs> um, yeah, so I think if we got this far, I'll try to, I, I'm not sure we'll be able to hear it, but I'll let you hear what actual uh, seismic digging actually sounds like, just for your reference in case you ever come across it. This was released during Operation Nor Northern Shield, actual recordings of excavation going on. All right, so clearly uh, it's not intuitive, right? Nobody can sit at home and hear that sound and say somebody's excavating beneath my house. And I think that's, uh, you know, after Operation Northern Shield, people kept coming up to me and saying, oh, you know, apparently all those people back in 2015 with a Facebook video of their sink, they were right, and Hezbollah had been excavating underneath their houses. But my answer remains that, uh, fortunately enough, they were wrong. And the thing that people associate with the sound of digging from natural experiences uh, around above ground are not what actual digging sounds like below ground. And at this point, the IDF has uh, a lot of experience and some expertise at finding this, uh, this type of excavation. And, you know, and we know some of what we're doing. Um, Another question that you should be asking me is what do you do once you actually find a tunnel? And to that, I'll just say that I can't go into it, but I will say that um, the equivalent of oil and mining, you know, there's a company, a small company, uh, Schlumberger, I think it's pronounced. Yeah, it's, they do a logging services for what to do once you find an oil reservoir. And this is just the list of the services that they offer online. And for each of these services, we kind of have the military equivalent of that service about you know, what we have to do about finding a tunnel once it's found. There are a lot of different uh, missions that you have to go into, and I won't be able to speak about them here today, but I can say there's a lot more than just tunnel detection. The point that I will make, though, is about this. This is another picture from uh, Northern Shield. This is the uh, concrete that we injected into one of the tunnels that we found coming out from the site that Hezbollah had been excavating from. This is the uh, some kind of industrial complex that they were working from. And once we found the tunnel in Israeli territory, we were able to uh, inject using high pressure concrete, a lot of concrete into there, and it came out on their side. And the reason that we do this is kind of, um, we want to be able to make sure that we don't allow the other side to come back to the tunnel and rebuild it without paying a great price. So we want to make it uneconomical for them to come back to a tunnel that we already found. We want to force them to re-excavate a tunnel. And we found that doing that with concrete is a pretty good option, basically. They can redig it if they want, but it's about the same effort as just starting a new tunnel. Um, and that's the reasoning behind that. That's why we've been doing it for uh, several years now with pretty good results. 
So that's the end of what to do once you find a tunnel. And I hope that'll satisfy your curiosity for now. I will say that to build uh, counter tunnel capabilities in the IDF, that was a pretty uh, large challenge. And the reason, again, we learned from the oil industry. Once an oil company gets a charter to look for oil someplace, they, uh, you know, they bring their experts out in the field and they plan surveys. Uh, and they have people working for them you know, with a lot of experience, PhDs for geophysics, who uh, know how to conduct these surveys. And they're the ones giving the tone about how to do this. And we kind of had to build the same capability for the IDF. Um, and basically, that's what we did. We took a bunch of people, physicists and electrical engineers, and some people who are neither but have a lot of talent for it. And we taught them how to conduct surveys to find tunnels, how to analyze the data. And at this point, they're teaching us how to do it. Um, and that has been a great success. I will say that before success came a lot of failures. And I couldn't show you pictures of our real failures. So this is just an open pit mine in Siberia. Um, but we dug a lot of open pit mines ourselves and found that we had been wrong in estimating that a tunnel was there. Um, but after a lot of failures, we were able to actually find a lot of tunnels. And this is the uh, Tunnel Detection Labs uh, trophy case with a rock from every tunnel found. So at this point, it's working pretty well for us. This is just an example of the most public uh, tunnel that we found, or the tunnel that we found most publicly uh, in October 2017. We were able to actually destroy a tunnel as it was being excavated with five terrorists from uh, Islamic Jihad on our side of the border uh, that were captured on this side of the border uh, when the tunnel was destroyed. And that was a uh, that was one case where we, uh, where the IDF had been able to uh, teach a lesson about uh, in infringing on our borders. My last point that I'd like to make is that basically, you know, some of the things that I said during this lecture are optimistic, and I don't want any of you to take that away from this uh, lecture. I want all of you to be pessimistic because winning a battle against an organization that operates against you and has infinite time and infinite patience to make themselves miserable as long as they make us miserable uh, as well. The game is to stay ahead of the curve. And I think we've seen that for any, uh, any capability that any military has. When you're doing asymmetric warfare, there's always the countermeasure and the way to beat that. And if you have excellent planes, they'll have excellent surface air missiles. And if you have excellent tanks, they'll have excellent anti-tank missiles. And basically, at this point, we have capabilities that are, are all right for tunnel detection. But I'm sure that the people on the other side, in Lebanon, in Gaza, uh, in Syria, and in Iran, they're out there working on the next generation. And that's really the reason that I'm so happy that uh, this convention came together, because we constantly need to be thinking about what the next step is for the other side, and then to be able to prepare our capabilities to meet that when it comes around. Um, thank you for now. If there are any questions, I think I have uh, five more minutes. I would like to suggest uh, changing the name from uh, Iron, uh, what is it? Uh, Iron <coughs> Tunnel Dome. Yeah. Iron Floor. <laughs> Um, so the question, I don't know if everybody heard, the question was that the tunnel that we uh, found and destroyed in October 2017, where five terrorists were actually captured inside Israel at the time, had been uh, already inside Israel. So they were breaching some, I guess, uh, law. Um, and th the answer is that they were, and even the, all the operation about how to de destroy the tunnel, we were very careful to not cross the border. The reason was that we did not want this... Uh, this operation to escalate into uh, a round of warfare between us and Gaza. And the reasoning was that if 
they had already come into Israel. We were very well within our rights and within the uh, rules of the game to uh, stop the tunnel uh, very dramatically. Uh, for other tunnels that we have found, basically we found many tunnels uh, that already crossed the border into Israel. Um, you know, there are different considerations when you're planning an operation like this about when and where to act. I'll let you uh, think about what they could be. And how the lawyers react to the fact that you pushed a lot of conflict into Lebanon? Uh, please, I'll refer to lawyers to answer that. <laughs> I don't think Hezbollah complained about it, though, to the United Nations at this point. I'm not aware that they did. Oh, thank you. Aside from the uh, successful and fruitful cooperation with the United States that you mentioned, have other countries and military services not developed capabilities upon which you could build and learn from? <coughs> So um, I think the first thing that I did when I uh, learned about my next position back in 2014 was to go online and see what countries have experience with that. And, you know, and obviously there's, here in, in Israel, there's a lot of experience with tunnel warfare when we were on the other side of the tunnel warfare. Um, but that was like 1,500, 2,000 years ago, right? Or, yeah, 2,000 plus years ago. Um, Recently, in modern history, there's the uh, case of North Korean tunnels into South Korea, and there's some uh, information available online about that. I read it pretty well, I'm sure. Um, there, the only cooperation we have uh, about this is with the United States. I understand. Um, so we do have, and, and again, you may have read uh, in the newspapers about this, we do have a, an effort to build a concrete wall along the Israeli uh, Gazan frontier. Um, and that it should be able to thwart tunneling into Israel if it ever reaches there. Um, I can tell you that for us, you know, that's the, we have a very complex obstacle built up that isn't just concrete, and we don't expect uh, the other side to even reach that. You know, we have countermeasures built in place to not even test the concrete wall, so that, that's the last uh, barrier that they'll ever have to face um, in case all other safety measures have failed. Um, outside in the, in the world, I don't know of any project that is similar to that. The main advantage of Israel is being very small, and the cost of that concrete wall is extremely high, even for a small border. I don't imagine that it will be replicable for uh, larger borders in the world. Um, but it is a valid option on the table, and you know, and we're doing it, and it's working well so far. Please. Cement. Wouldn't that make an easier reflection surface for GPR? 
All right. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'll say that I imagine that it is possible to build uh, it is possible to build operating bases that are resistant to tunneling uh, coming out inside the base. For us here in Israel, that's not as big an issue anymore since our bases are all on one side of the fence and we try to stop the tunnels from even crossing the fence. We want to pick up on them before they uh, come into Israel. I will say another point though, and that is that we have never seen a tunnel uh, come out of the ground at the place where you're going to attack. And our, our understanding is that to launch a raid, you have to have your forces well prepared, you know, take a deep breath, everybody in line, and then launch the raid. And that's extremely hard to do when you're climbing, you know, 10 or 20 stories up some staircase or up a ladder, and then every person comes out by themselves and will actually engage in fighting uh, by themselves. So our understanding is that you always want to have some kind of staging area outside of the target that you want to attack, where everybody can climb out from underground, put their backpacks on, you know, load, load their, uh, load their uh, weapons, and get in formation before you launch the attack. So I wouldn't suggest building bases that have, you know, uh, steel flooring to prevent tunnels coming out inside. Instead, I would invest in, you know, standoff detection on the fence of the base and 100 meters out and 200 meters out to prevent tunneling into bases. Regarding the question about the GPR, um, that's an excellent question, and if you're a radar engineer, I'd like to speak to you later and see what your thoughts about that are. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question was, uh, I said something about, you know, being able to detect voids, the interface between ground and air when uh, using ground penetrating radar. Um, and the question was, shouldn't it be easier to detect the interface between ground and concrete or concrete and air? And the answer to that is that um, there's a lot of research into it. And there are some answers. I won't be able to give them out right now. But in some circumstances, it makes it easier. In some circumstances, it makes it harder. And it's an active research field if you're interested. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.